you have a Bible this morning, turn to Matthew chapter number 6. And while you're turning there, I uh, say appreciate the music this morning, appreciate you being here. Uh, to be quite honest, I was a little discombobulated earlier and um, don't know what I said. And uh, I think I welcome visitors if you're here. Appreciate you being here. I would like to meet you if that's um, something you would like to do. And uh, we do have some cards out in the, in the um, pews to uh, let us know if you do that, and you can turn them in to either me or somebody that'll be hanging out over by the coffee area or one of our greeters, and uh, we'll send you a, a thank you card. But no, we have a little gift we'd give you as well. But we wanna, we're starting, and um, I told the church more on Wednesday night. If you're missing Wednesdays, come join us. We've been having a good crowd, uh, but I've been telling them a little more about kind of our strategy and as fall begins and our staff knows that we're gung-ho into reaching out to those who have kind of, we've been missing for a while and then reaching into our community. And so uh, we're keeping up with who's here and who's not here and want to make sure we acknowledge you. And uh, we've got visitors, have a lot of visitors been coming in lately and we appreciate that and we don't want to overlook you. And um, so uh, the, the interesting thing is, and I've, I've kind of joked about this, I keep forgetting to talk about money and uh, which most people don't mind when the pastor forgets to talk about money, but we used to just turn in those visitor cards and the offering plate because that's how they did it in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 back in the day. And we got out of that, and now people are like, whoa. And I know many of you are just sitting on Uncle Joe's money that he keeps sending you month after month, and you're thinking, what do I want to do with this? What can I do with this extra money? And um, so we do have some boxes. We've got offering plates, and then you can give online. I was kind of joking about the Uncle Joe money, but some of you don't need that money, and uh, God does. So if you want to send that money somewhere else, should I tithe off of that free money? That's not Matthew 6, so it's all right. But I do say I appreciate those of you who are faithful to give, and I do forget it, but uh, when I think about the visitor cards, I think it's so different. We don't do it the way we used to do it. And so then I forget to talk about money, but uh, you've been faithful. Most of you, I think, I haven't got a, um, I haven't asked Brenda for a sheet to see who quit, but no, you've been faithful and God's faithful. And we have ministries going on as we move into fall, as we move into uh, school starting back and Awana starting back. Uh, we've had a lot of um, people reach out about Awana and registration. I think that's next Wednesday. That would be the first, right? Next Wednesday would be the first this coming Wednesday is the first. That's, uh, I say, wow, August is done. So next week it starts to be cool again, right? No, ne this coming Wednesday is uh, registration. That'll be the first. If you've got kids that are, uh, I guess, two years old through fifth grade, they can register. Looks like uh, I saw Facebook said Kona Ice. Is that the case? Kona Ice is, um, I mean, that's like Jesus Ices right there. And so if you come, you'll get something free. And then the next week, Awana starts back, which will be the 8th. And uh, now I've got my calendar right in my head. And uh, we're going to start our services and everything at 6.30, beginning on that September 8th, Wednesday night. So just to add another change to everything crazy going on, we hope that will help our families with children to be able to come and get home at a bedtime. We don't have bedtime at my house, so it doesn't apply to us. It's just a free-for-all. By midnight, we're just trying to get people resting, but um, a lot going on, and uh, all that can be tied back to your faithfulness to not just be here, but to bring your children, and uh, many of you serving. I know there's been meetings with um, some of our leaders, and I appreciate that, and um, your, your serving, your faithfulness to be here and to give allows us to carry on ministries and many, many more things that are going to be going on, uh, like homecoming. We're trying to get homecoming back like it used to be, and we're going to have a free meal. Uh, so if you've signed up, then you're going to enjoy that. If you haven't, don't come. No. Uh, so the homecoming is just in a couple weeks. And I want you to be here. I'm going to preach probably what will end up being two different Sunday sermons. So homecoming will be extended to two Sundays. Not really, but um, about the family, about being a part of God's family, being a part of the church family. And I want you to be here. If you know anybody that um, say they're still a member here and they're not going somewhere else, uh, convict their hearts along with the Holy Spirit and invite them to homecoming and say we'd be glad to have you back and we do have sign-ups if you want to. We're going to have a catered lunch after 
which uh, won't cost you anything if you give. Uh, we've actually cross-referenced your sign-up with those of you who are faithful to give to see if you can actually get the free meal. <laughs> and uh, if not, it's $10 at the door, and that just helps knock a dent in it. No, just kidding. For real, sign up, and then uh, we'll, be, we'll know how many. I think next Sunday's the deadline to sign up, so we have an accurate indication of how much food we need. But I want you to be here. We do have a, we have a special gift for those of you who come and uh, want one if you don't then you don't have to have it, but um, we're making a big deal, and I'm making a big deal about family, and uh, that's kind of the theme for homecoming, and you'll kind of get that vibe over the next weeks. Have you found Matthew chapter 6 yet? It's a difficult place to find. It's a very familiar passage. I'm going to do my best to preach it. I've preached this passage before, probably many times in many different capacities, but um, as before we read it, I want to challenge you that have been church members for a while, been in church a while, no scripture. I have to challenge myself this often to not let a familiar passage uh, just sweep right by my heart and my mind. Oh, I know this passage. I've heard this before. I'm good. I want, I want you to, while we read it and when we pray in just a second, to say, God, will you show me something in this for today? I, I don't, and, and I feel like I'm very explanatory today for whatever reason. I don't just draw straws every Sunday to see what I'm going to preach. I do pray about it. Uh, It's always a different question uh, from the pastors in that pastor world, like, how do you come up with what you're preaching? I usually, my standard answer is, well, Saturday night, I just start scrolling through sermons.com and see which one looks like I would feel most confident with. I don't do that. Um, it's It's probably... Uh, several different ways to where you feel as a pastor that God has laid something on your heart, that he's leading you in that direction. Of course, I'm a person, I'm a man, I have, I have feelings, I have flesh, I have sin, and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of times the challenge is, is it something you want to preach or something God wants you to preach? Or is it you're trying to get back at somebody, you know, if you find out something that week and somebody's been doing something, like, I'm going to get them with this one this week, I hope they're here for that. It's, pastors don't do that because we never know if you're going to be here or not. So eliminate that from your minds. Like, I got one ready for him. We don't know if you're showing up, and then everybody else has to put up with it. So that's not how that works. Um, But it was interesting this week that this kind of plays off of where I've been the last couple weeks. If you were here last week, we talked about the consequences of idolatry. For months, uh, several months, we were in Jeremiah. Talking about Judah's primary failure in their sin was idolatry. And last week, we kind of concluded with what we knew has been coming, that the ultimate consequence for idolatry is destruction. There's no way out of that. If you serve another God other than the one true God, there is ultimately destruction. It's biblical, it's historical, and it will be that way until the final destruction, which is coming. But today I want to talk about the consequences of lordship. I hope you're encouraged today by what God is going to teach us, what Matthew 6 tells us, what Jesus speaks to us in this Sermon on the Mount. If you are a true born-again believer, there are some consequences for serving him and selling out to him that are beneficial to you. That in this crazy world we live in, that you can find peace, you can find comfort, you can have uh, solitude, if you will, in knowing that God's going to take care of you. And so let's read together, if you want to stand as we honor God's word, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. If you know it by heart, read it. Jesus says, therefore, we'll cover that. I say to you, take no thought for your life. For those teenagers and younger who are the most careless people on the planet right now, he's not saying, don't care about your life. We'll cover that. But he says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor for your body, what kind of clothes you're going to wear. Then he asks this question, is your body, is life not more than meat and your body more than clothes or raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, the birds, they don't sow, they don't plant gardens, neither do they reap. 
They don't have barns that they store up their food, yet their heavenly Father, your heavenly Father, sorry, it's not their heavenly, your heavenly Father does what? He feeds them. Are you not much better than them? Which of you, followers, disciples, that's who we're talking to, which of you can, by taking thought, add one cubit under your stature? A cubit's about 18 inches. Obviously, God's not saying, can you add 18 inches of height to your body? He's talking about a lifespan. Which of you, by taking thought, and why take thought for raiment or clothes? Consider the lilies of the fields. Look at the wildflowers. They toil not. They didn't make themselves show up. I did that, is what he says. And even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Therefore, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow isn't, or is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, disciples. I've got to cover this because I'm not going to preach it in a second. I've read this a million times. I've heard it preached hundreds probably. And you think, well, the, the crap. God is saying to us, look at the fields. Take the flowers out. It's grass. It's just a grassy field. It's not your lawn that you keep up and spend hundreds and hundreds or thousands of dollars on every year. It's just a field that has grass and then this North Carolina summer hits and it, it's gone. In other words, he's saying, think of the logic in uh, or the illogic in taking care of this grass. But what God does is he clothes the fields with beautiful flowers, wildflowers, sunflowers, lilies, that this grass, this field that's really not really important to anybody, he clothes that with beauty. Even Solomon in all his glory couldn't match up to this is what he's saying. Wherefore, God so clothed the grass that is unimportant, burns up. If he would take that type of care to clothe it with beauty, what about you, you of little faith? Therefore, verse 31, take no thought saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or where shall we be clothed? Verse 32, for all these things do the Gentiles seek, the lost people seek. Your heavenly Father, church, believers, he says, followers of Christ, disciples, your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that we just talked about shall be added unto you. I know it finishes with verse 34. We'll cover that in just a second. Would you pray? Father, thank you for your word. God, my desire is for you through the Holy Spirit and through the power of your word to encourage some Christians today to bring peace to some believers today. In this room, those many that are watching, and those that will hear later, God, we need to be reminded today that you love us, that you care for us, and you're going to take care of us. And I pray that someone is encouraged by that today. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was growing up many years ago, I'm getting old enough now I can say that, when I was a boy, and used to go to church, and um, I, I remember, and I've alluded to this many times, I, I remember even going to college and hearing during Spiritual Emphasis Week and the revivals where preachers would talk about lordship, and they would, they would say, lordship salvation, and it was as if it was different from regular salvation. Anybody know where I'm talk, going? And here's what I'm going to say to start off. There is no lordship salvation and salvation. There is only lordship salvation. One of the things we've done today, and I've made this very clear, and I won't elaborate too much on this, and what I believe in the American church today is we've convinced people that there are several different types of salvation. I told the church Wednesday night, and I tell them more things, maybe they'll share the words with you, um, that I don't want everybody to know, to be quite honest. And why are you not live streaming anymore? I don't want you to know. I don't want it to be recorded, what I'm saying. No. 
Jesus made it clear, and, I, and this is so powerful, and, and to be quite honest, it's scary. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. There is a strong differenti differentiation between those who really call him Lord and those who just casually say, I'm saved. And I don't want mean to, to scare anybody. That's not my point. I just want to draw a clear distinction that Jesus made a very clear distinction in his teaching here, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. That there are some who say, Lord, but do not the things which I ask. And there are some who he is Lord of all. Church, this is, this is not fun to say, but there are many who are on their way to meet God who call him Lord every day. But he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. As, as this world, as this world gets more and more pressurized, we're starting to see. It's beginning to be revealed as to who is and who isn't. Lordship is when he is Lord, King, and ruler of your life. That's born again salvation. If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. That's salvation. That is dropping your nets, follow me, forsake all, and follow me. That hasn't changed. God's criteria for Christians, for believers following Christ, disciples of Christ, have not changed. Hey, he didn't say, well, I know it's getting tougher and tougher to be a disciple, so you don't really have to sell out like you used to. That's not how it works. But if we're not careful, we'll be so soft and sensitive in church that we convince people that it's all right to be halfway Christian. That cannot, I cannot stand before God as a pastor and know that I allowed somebody to think there was an easy way to get into heaven and that you could live willy-nilly and get there. It's not gonna be on my hands. Mom, dad, you're the preacher and pastor of your family. It shouldn't be on your hands either. I'm not talking to just the 40-year-old dads that have 10 and 15-year-old sons. I'm talking to, to the 70-year-old dads that's got the 40-year-old sons that you've been praying that they get back in church when you might ought to start praying that they get saved. You can't serve two masters. Where'd that come from? Oh, it's just a few verses right before where we were at. See, the context, the pretext to the context is some other verses that you've heard before. Where Jesus starts talking about treasures, and where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then he finally, I think, I'm the only one to look, in verse 24, he says, no man can serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. You'll serve one and despise the other. No man can serve God and, here's the good King James word that we all know and say, what does that mean? Mammon. Money, riches, stuff. Listen to what he says. No man can serve two masters. You can't do it. I am convinced that churches every Sunday are full of people, and not just on Sunday morning, but through the week, who their minds are unstable because they're trying to serve two masters. Can I try to serve two masters as a believer? Yes, sir, I can because I've got flesh and I've got desires. Will I be healthy? Will I have peace? Will I have comfort? Will I have satisfaction? Absolutely not. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. There's a whole lot in this text, and I hope I get to it. But I read a lot, and I studied a lot. One of my study Bibles at the top, it says the title, and this is not my title. The title is The Cure for Anxiety. It's the CSB study Bible. You got that? Yeah. The cure for anxiety. And if you could bottle it up, you could sell it for millions. Because about one out of four Americans, even in the church, are on some type of medication prescribed by doctors for anxiety. Did you know that? You're looking around. You're like, which one? <laughs> it's probably you. It's all right. I'm not here to fuss about that. And I understand there's some medical thing. I'm not getting into that. Everybody all right? Love me. Be sweet to me. It's been a tough, 
tough few days and weeks. Y'all do understand, I'm here to help us, not to hurt us. I want us to grow together and love together and be healthy together, not to, well, I can't believe you said that. He must not like me. No, that's not what I'm here for. I hope you know that. There is a cure for certain anxieties in life. Can we not all agree that we got enough problems as it is? I mean, everybody got some extras to go around for the ones that are doing just fine. Raise your hand if you don't have enough, and then you raise your hand if you got too many. And we'll just, you know, socialism. We'll <laughs> spread the wealth. We'll spread them out so everybody can appreciate. The pretext to our text is verses 19 through 24, which is all about, now I've got to cover this real quick. When Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount in the verses before, he's talking about treasures and laying up treasures in heaven, not on earth. And he's talking to people who have treasures. This is just free, but it, it brings text, it brings context to our text. When he says, lay not up treasures uh, on earth where moth and dust does corrupt, but lay up treasures in heaven. He's, he's talking to a crowd of people, by the way, Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking, he's addressing the people with treasures. Which ones is he talking to? Raise your hand. We need to see this morning. No, no he's talking, listen, but here, here's the deal. It's, it's, it's so, to me, it's kind of funny because in every group, there's all kind of different people. Like, if I start talking about money around here, some of you are like, yeah, I got plenty. And some of you are like, oh, oh we ain't asking for another dollar or whatever. By the way, I've been pastor three years, and I ain't got up here and asked and begged for money in three years. Never have. But I can. But I'm not. And I might one day, but I'm not right now. But in every crowd, there's people that are, you know, some have money, some don't have money. Some got a lot, some got a little. Some think they got some, some, you know, there's everybody out here is different. In Jesus' crowd, it's the same way. So in this portion, in verses 19 through 24, he's talking to those who have treasures. But now he's talking to Kannapolis folks. In verses 25 through 34, he's talking to those who ain't got no treasures. He's going to cover all the bases. Listen. It's not that simple, but he does talk. Like, like if the preacher gets up and starts talking about those of you with millions of dollars, you need to be responsible and good stewards of it. And some of you are like, hey, he ain't talking to me. So he didn't talk to them. Now he's talking to everybody, especially those without treasures. And that's what verse 25 through 34 is. He's talking to disciples who may not have a lot of treasures, but he assures them that if, you're, if he's Lord of your life, He'll take care of you. Anybody ever heard that before in church? Here's, here's, here's where we're at. Do we believe it? Are we clinging to it? Are we depending on it? It's the difference in, yeah, I heard that one preached one time. Oh, yeah, that was in my, my daily bread the other day. I, I heard that one. Or are we believing it? Are we holding to it. It's Jesus talking to us and he's saying, I will take care of you. So there's at least three consequences in this text that I have found that ought to give every believer that has made Jesus Lord of their life, ought to give them some peace. Three consequences for those of us who have made Jesus Lord of our life. I feel like I still need to talk a little bit more introductory because of the context. Because of the context of this text and the context of our life. I said this Wednesday, and this is kind of where my heart is right now. And yes, I have sinned and fallen short of God's glory uh, even this week. It's happened. I don't want to get to the place 
where I have to start seeking him first. I want to be at the place where I am continually seeking him first. There's a lot happening in our culture, in our country, and in our community. Listen, Christians, I'm talking to Christians right now. I'm talking to born-again believers who say they're disciples. This is still a little bit of the end. But seek ye first, Matthew 6, 23, 6, 33. Seek ye first is not something that you begin doing when you need something. Oh, oh, it's getting tough. I got some decisions to make. I better start seeking him first. Um, I don't want to use this completely out of context, but I've, as a pastor and being in hospitals and stuff and over the years, and, and my mom kind of found herself in a situation like this recently, so it's kind of fresh on my mind. Uh, and, and there's another person that had some uh, surgery here recently, and they always uh, tell you, you know, you want to get ahead of the pain. And people are like, I don't want any pain, man. I don't want that stuff. And then about six hours later, like, oh, look, what am I going to do? I didn't know it was going to be this bad. And now you got to make up for that pain to get caught up. But if you would have started like the medical professional told you, because they've probably done one or two of these surgeries before, you might not have had the pain that you had. Everybody, anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm not saying, well, whatever. So I'm just like, Let's not go retroactively on. This is not a retroactive passage of Scripture where God says, you found yourself in a mess. You better start seeking me first, brother. That's not what this text is about. Jesus is saying, Christians, seek me first. Disciples, seek me first. Consistently, constantly, without stopping, seek me every day, every hour. This thing doesn't work retroactively. God, you promised you would take care of all my needs. And God turns around and says, yeah, yeah, but you promised you would be faithful to me. Oh, that sounds like a mean God. No, that sounds like a God who gave you a promise. But you didn't do your part. Many of us could testify to the fact that we got ourselves in messes when we got away from him being Lord of our life. Don't you dare blame God. Don't I dare blame God for not doing his part when I was so careless and he wasn't Lord. Make decisions based on you. Make decisions based on jobs. Make decisions based on spouses. Make decisions based on money. Make decisions based on kids. Make decisions based on everything other than him being Lord of your life and then hold him accountable for not meeting your needs. That's not how this works. We found this out before. Many of us have been there and Jesus is saying now, hey, seek me first. First, preeminent priority. All these things will be added unto you. Now I feel like we can start. There's three things that we see in this text that as Christians, as believers, as disciples, we have access to consequences, privileges, benefits. Because membership has its privileges, right? Number one, we have access to serenity. I'm using these words intentionally. What is serenity? Serenity is peace. It's the word unworried. It's like unworried. I'm unworried. Anybody, if I had a bottle of unworried pills, anybody want to take me up on some? I'll take some. The first one's free, by the way. Next week, cost. All right, fundraiser. It's unworried, at ease, peace, serenity. Believers have access. Disciples have access. People who have made Jesus order their life have access to serenity, even in a troubled, worrisome world. Amen. Oh, it's so hard not to say things that I know I'm going to say later. I want you to notice how many times the word worry is in your Bible in the text we read. Now, before, before you go further, there's a lot of King James out there. And you say, oh, it ain't in my Bible. It says, take no thought. Take no thought. King James says, take no thought. That's the word worry. That's the word, don't worry. That's the phrase, don't worry. Take no thought. Okay, so everybody's with me now. Um, let me see if I can find where they're at here. 
Verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought, don't worry for your life. The word life there is important, it sets the stage for everything. What is life? Life. It's the word for breath or breathe. Listen, here's, here's, these are strategic, strategic, intentional words. I'm not a doctor. I thought I wanted to be one time. But life, uh, breath is necessary for life. So the word there for life is breathe or breath. No breath, no life. Anybody have trouble with that one, right? We understand that breathing is a necessity for life. This text is all about necessities. Therefore, take no thought, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about the necessities of life. Take no thought for, don't worry about your life. Verse 27, which of you by taking thought or worrying can add one cubit unto a stature? Verse 28, why take you thought? Worry for your raiment. Uh, verse 31, therefore take no thought. Don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Verse 34, take therefore no thought or worry for tomorrow. Worry's in there five times in our text that I just read in verses 25 through 34. Three are different than the other two. I really want to look at the verse, the, the two. The word worry there means to be anxious. Listen, this is so important. The word worry or take no thought, it's a word for anxious or anxiety, but it's not just, it's a, it's a very intentional word that was used here in the Greek. It's anxious or anxiety to the point of distraction. That's the key. Distracted from what? To steal all the thunder. Him being Lord. Is it possible for a Christian to get so worried about stuff that we forget he's Lord? That's the right answer. This is what he's talking about. How in the world? I think God must know what's going on. This sounds like it's applicable for all days and all years to the end of time. Yeah. And listen, listen, listen. I, I got to keep reminding me and us, because many of us are, is it all right to say that some of us are doing better than we were when we grew up? It's all right. It's all right to say that. Some are like, oh, well, I'm poor. I don't have anything. That's all right. Now, most of us are comfortable, if we're quite honest, comparative. So what happens is the more, the more we get comfortable with our finances, with our houses, with our cars, with our toys and all that kind of stuff, the easier, to, the easier it is to forget that this applies to me. Necessities? I'm more worried about my boats and my cars and my campers and my blah, 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 blah. What else? I've missed something, somebody. My golf clubs or something expensive. And we, and we forget he's talking to me. Because here's what's common to everybody, rich and poor. We all have necessities. We all need food. We all need water. We all need something to cover these ugly bodies up with. <laughs> Raymond sounds much more modest. We went back to, I needed some back to school raiment, so we went shopping. He uses the word worry here five times, Jesus does. Three of them are pretty obvious. Don't worry about your life, don't worry about what you eat. But I want you to notice the other two in verse 27 and 28. In verse 27, he says, he asks a question. If you've known me for any amount of time, I'm always intrigued by Jesus and God questions. He's God. Why are you asking me a question for God? Aren't you God? It's always rhetorical because God doesn't need you to answer. He's God. But in this case, Jesus uses these questions, and it's, it's what um, scholars refer to as a rabbinical argument. So what, how a rabbi would teach. Jesus is a rabbi. He was known as a rabbi. And he's using a rabbinical argument, and they understand what he's doing. And he asks these rhetorical questions. And in verse number 27, he says, this question, he asks, uh, which of you, by taking thought or worrying, can add one cubit into his stature? We've already covered. He's not talking about getting 18 inches taller. He's talking about can add to your lifespan. So he asks the question. He poses the question to the followers, to the disciples. Which of you, by worrying, can add a day to your life? 
Don't answer. That's what he said. Don't answer. You know the answer. The answer is you can't. So why are you worrying? And then he says, take no thought. Uh, Then he says, and why take thought for your clothing? Why are you worrying about this? I found this interesting. And this plays right into this week. We got to take care of our bodies. We only have one. See that? How everybody was like, I'm not not touching that one. I'm not touching that one. (laughs) He doesn't take care of his. Look at him, big fat sloth. I don't know. (laughs) Nobody amen when I said take care of your bodies. But everybody, I'm not going to do that. That would take us. Body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the only one we have to work for, work with. It's all right. We're all out of shape and unhealthy. I know. Let's do something about it. By the way, we're clearing out some stuff. We're going to put walking paths down there so y'all can come walk. Where is he going with this? This week, this is, I hope you didn't read this article, and I hope you can enjoy it and not be scared when you leave here. This week, this was, this was reported by many real news sources that if um, eating one hot dog can take 36 minutes off of your life. Anybody see that? Am I making this? There you go. Some of you started, got, you got your calculator out. As soon as you read that article, he's like, I don't know how much time I had, but whoa, I just cut it short. I'm not going to call any names, but there's somebody sitting in the middle section that every Sunday when they were on, in a mission, on, on, on the mission field in Honduras, he had a pack of hot dogs every week. <laughs> and I watched him eat just about the whole pack on a Sunday when I was there. 36 times, what, six? That's a, whoa. Every week. How long were y'all there? No, I'm just kidding. It's like, Ed's phone is on. I just said your name. I wasn't supposed to. I was like, he's on his way out of here. We got to get him healthy. It has nothing to do with anything other than we can't add time to our life. Some of you, I just messed you all up because now you're worrying about your lifespan because of how many hot dogs you've eaten. Take that away. Jesus uses this, what's called rabbinical argument. What is a rabbinical argument and why is he? It's used universally. And here's the thought, here's the theme, here's the lesson. Jesus would ask a rhetorical question, basically saying, and here's the thought, if God can do a great thing, he can do a lesser thing. In other words, if God created you, time out, 20 second time out, creation is important. Teaching creation is important. A lot of things trickle down from creation, doctrinally, theologically, and very practically. So here we go back up to this rabbinical argument. If God created you greater thing, he can certainly feed you lesser thing. If God created the fields and the grass and the whatever, certainly he can put clothes on a field. If he created a mountain, certainly he can put some flowers on it. And and Jesus uses this article, uh, this uh, argument, making it very clear. Hey, guys, if God is your God, if he is your creator, he will take care of you. If he can do the great, he can certainly do the lesser. And so he poses this question and he asks, I thought about this and thought about creation real quick and I've got more notes that I won't cover, but think about creation with Adam and Eve. God did a miraculous, only God thing in creating a man and woman out of dust. You believe that? It's what it says. It's a lot more believable than some of the other garbage y'all want to listen to. God created the earth, he created the dust, Created man, blew into man, breathed into man, air, made him a soul, made him a person. How do you get that? It's what the Bible says. If God can do that, listen, listen, it's so simple. Basically, this argument is saying God did that. He didn't say, there you are, have at it. Have fun, figure it out. No, he created them. He put them in a garden that met their needs with a whole bunch of fruit trees. Covered this the other night. A whole bunch of fruit trees. For what? Just to take care of them. 
Keep them weeded. Trim them back. No, that wasn't the, God was the creator. He created them and he gave them a place to be sustained, to have their needs met. Fruit trees everywhere. There, it can go on, but it turns into another sermon, so I have to stop. Did he put clothes on them? He didn't have to, but he did clothe them. That's a whole different sermon. Not with the leaves. They clothed themselves with the leaves after they had been distracted, remember that word, from him being God. See, that's, that's a good 15-minute sermon I just did in two minutes. Because when he's Lord, he takes care of us. When he is not Lord, we have to take care of ourselves. They covered themselves with something they made. When God had covered them with what they needed and provided for them. As a Christian, as a believer, we have access to peace and serenity. As a believer, we have access or acknowledgement of his sovereignty. This is really short and simple, and I'm not going to say a lot, although I could. But as a Christian, there is peace and assurance in knowing that God is sovereign. Listen, I, I, I don't know that this is the right way to pray, selfish way to pray, but we all deal with it whether we want to admit it or not. I mean, if you've been around here a long time, you can only remember one major hurricane that hit us. That was in 1989. But I'm, I'm not, I don't live in Louisiana. I don't know, but, here, but, but I'm called to pray for them. And, and here's the thing, a lot of times, and I don't know exactly, if, I hope this helps. How are these people praying this morning? There are Christians in Louisiana that are going to be hit with a Category 4 that's already been 155 miles an hour this morning. They're in the worst possible place. They're talking about 15 to 20 inches of rain on top of storm surge. They're talking 16 feet of storm surge. That's catastrophic devastation. My point is, how are those people praying this morning? As a Christian... As a believer, they're, they're probably trying to get out, trying to take care of stuff, and I hope our hearts as Christian brothers and sisters has sympathy for them, at least enough to pray. Even if you don't know how to pray, at least pray for them that God will do a work in their life. Here's my thought about sovereignty. The, the Christian that's in that place this morning who's going to be devastated, their homes are most likely going to be devastated, they can still have peace about necessities because they know God is sovereign. Now that's, a, I'm just gonna be, that's a lot easier for me to say it right here than if I was preaching in Louisiana this morning. Matter of fact, they might boo me out of the church if I said that this morning. I hope they wouldn't. Apply that to our lives. It may not be a Hurricane Ida coming, but all of us are faced with some pretty rough storms that are gonna knock us for a loop. We can see them coming sometimes. We, we see the forecast. We know what's happening. We get the news. We get the verdict. We get the, bat, we get the whatever. But we can have peace and assurance knowing that God is sovereign, that it didn't take him by surprise, that he is very well aware. Oh, I'm preaching it and hadn't read the verse. And here's the point. He says, listen, in verses uh, 26, uh, basically in 28 through 30, he covers it, but I want you to look at verse 32, and then I'll bump away. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, unbelievers, for your heavenly Father does what? Knows that you have need of all these things. He knows. He is sovereign. He is omniscient. He knows you have needs. If he's your father, he knows, and you know he knows. And there's comfort that comes from that. It's a consequence of being a believer. Listen, but he changes his tone. Jesus changes his tone here, and he says in verse 30, Wherefore, if God clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow isn't, and the oven is shall 
shall he not more clothe you, O you of little faith? He compares those who doubt God's sovereignty, doubt God's knowledge as those who have no faith. As a Gentile, an unbeliever, true disciples, true believers have faith and confidence that God knows. Knows that I have necessities, God. You know it. You know I need that. Food, drink, clothes. Not, you know I need that new whatever. We have an acknowledgement. Listen, I probably didn't do a good job of preaching that point. But you may not know what's going on. And I may not know what's going on, but I can rest in the assurance that he knows what's going on and that he's my dad and he's not surprised by it. Number three, we can have the assurance of sufficiency. We acknowledge he's sovereign. We have access to peace and serenity, and we also have assurance of his sufficiency. Verse 33. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Listen, why is the but there? The but is the transition. It's the contrast. But, in other words, you don't act like these Gentiles. These Gentiles seek after these things as if they don't have a heavenly father to supply them because they don't. He is not the God of the world. He is the God of the world. But he is not the heavenly father to everyone. We're not all children of God. That sounds great. Put it in your children's, you know, storybook time. But he does love all the children of the world, but we're not all children of God. Well, that sounds mean. You shouldn't say that. No, no, what it sounds like is truth that needs to be taught so people God. Because that, that follows a wrong, a, a doctrinally impure thought process that will lead somebody to an eternity separated from God in hell. Because we wanted to be popular, we wanted to be friendly, we didn't want to be uh, exclusive, we didn't want to hurt feelings, and so we adopt this universalist doctrine. We're all children of God. Listen, see, see how the, see how this is. Side dirt road, here we go. See how the enemy uses fluffy terminology to mess us up? We're all children of God. Therefore, we shouldn't be divided. You ever heard anything like that? We're all God's children, so we shouldn't be. Listen, that's flawed from day one. Jesus says, some of you are children and some of you aren't children, therefore there will be division. He said it. You think I, bring, I came to bring peace? No, rather division. He said it himself. Why? Because he understood when you become, when he becomes Lord of your life, it is a strong, stark, bold division between you and people who don't make him Lord of his, their life. Everybody, we're all God's children. He does love everybody. We're not all God's children. We, we're broaching a very dangerous path to a universalist picture where God, see, if you believe that, then you'll have, it'd be very easy to believe that God wouldn't send anybody to hell because he loves the world and we're all God's children. So once you get there, surely, and this is, you say, well, this is crazy talk. No, this is permeating even unfortunately, some liberal seminaries around our country. The where if, if, you, if, you are this, if you believe this or you believe this or you're following that religion, no, surely God would allow you into heaven because you were fooled or you were, you, you, were, you were really sold out to this religion. God wouldn't not let you in heaven because you were a fill in the blank. Because you were a sold out Muslim. You were a sold out Buddhist. You're a sold out Hinduist that practice these things falsely without knowing in ignorance. And you get to heaven and God says, well, they were sold out. They were misinformed. Come on in. That's the thought. That's the doctrine. And that's where this, we're all children of God leads. We've got to be careful. 
Now, we don't follow that illogic. As Christians, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. But we're different. We're different. We don't act like other believe, uh, unbelievers. We don't ask like other unbelievers. But you, he says, followers, seek first. This is short because I started off saying what seeking is. It's a continuous activity. The Greek word there actually means, hey, it's not something you start when you get in trouble. It's something you are continuously doing. Christians, that's God's expectation for us. He will take care of us when we follow him. What he's saying is instead of worrying about what you'll eat, drink, and wear, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these things, eat, drink, garments, they will be added unto you. Don't worry about those things. Remember worry? It's a distraction, to the point of distraction. Don't be distracted by your necessities to the point where you take your eyes off of God. It's our toughest challenge in life is to do things ourselves and our way. Listen, I, I like Elvis. <laughs> Good Christians do. No, um, I'm going I'm to tell on myself, but I'm hopefully going to make a point. My wife doesn't even know this. She knows I like Elvis. Um, only the gospel songs, you know. That's, that's the only ones he ever won awards for. <laughs> the other day, uh, I, was, I, was, I was on the Elvis channel on Satellite <laughs> Series Radio. <laughs> Told you I do like him. It's not, I wasn't lying. And um, one of my favorites came on. I wish I could say it was um, There'll Be Peace in the Valley, but it wasn't. It was one that Frank Sinatra also did called My Way. If I was lost, <laughs> this is completely derailing, and I had my funeral, I would want that to be played at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> but since I'm saved, <laughs> that's not the way it should be done. So that it just started. And you know how that works. I just pulled in the driveway and the song just started. I'm not getting out of the car with this going. So I sit in the car. And I wallowed in my own sinfulness as I belted out and did it my and I, wait. And then I prayed and asked God to forgive me for being so selfish and sinful. But that's our biggest challenge as a Christian is doing it my way. Some of us have a harder time than others. Because you know who I am. I'm going to do it my way. My way or the highway. That's what every dad in here said at least one time. Over 50. I, I haven't used that one yet, but I've said some things similar. What does that have to do with this? Our biggest challenge as Christians, especially men many times, with full of testosterone, and I'll get it done, I'll make it happen no matter what, is not trusting in God for our necessities. Listen, here, here's, here's how it ends. Ah, oh, I tried my best. It's almost 12. I tried my best. So verse 34 ends by saying, this is, this is no, no version that I know of. Hey, don't worry about tomorrow. There's that word worry again. Why? It's enough worries for tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough, I think King James says evil. <laughs> There's enough evils in tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today. What does that have to do with the text? I think it has everything to do with the text because Basically, how I, how I see it is, God says, there's enough worry to go around. Can everybody, we're cl coming close. If you say, yeah, and amen, we'll, we'll finish this thing. There's enough worries to go around. By the way, there's a distinguishment in, in this text even in between, between things that are worth worrying about and things that aren't worth worrying about. Anxious about, well, I'm anxious about, uh, well, you can be anxious about, but you don't have to be anxious. Listen, here's what he's saying. It's a lot to be anxious about in life, but you can eliminate these as a believer. Now, some of you are worry warts. Oh, Kids explain, parents explain about that. Worry. You worry all the time. You worry about everything. You worry about things you can't control, things you can't control. You worry about, look for things to worry about. You run out of things to worry about, and you're going to make a new list of things to worry about. So I just worry. I just worry. I've talked I've talk to people. I just worry. That's what I do. Like, you, like, you're really worried about what you have to worry about. It's crazy. 
And in a sense, verse 34 says, there's a lot of things to worry about. But believer, those who I am Lord of your life, you don't have to worry about these. I got these covered. You can eliminate those from your list if you're seeking me first. God will take care of you, church, believer, Christian, born again, truly born again. It's crazy how we have to say that these days. Studies go out, research go out, polls go out, and they ask now, are you, are you Christian? Yeah. And then they have another one, are you born again Christian? That's, that's where we're at. No, there's only one. It's a born again, life changed believer who has made Jesus the Lord of your life. That's the person I'm talking to right now. Jesus says, be not dismayed. Old, old song says, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Amen. He's promised it. You, got, you want to worry about something else? Worry about it. Don't worry about this. Take care of it. Now, if you're here, if you're living this life, and he's not first in your life, you got some more things to worry about because you got to worry about this. He's only promised to take care of your food, clothing, shelter, water, for those who are faithful to him, serving him. I don't want to get too personal, but I know, and even as I was preparing and going through some things, there's a lot of people in this room. There's a lot of people watching. There's a good number watching today, I was told. Um, and there's a lot of your friends and your family who are stressed out and anxious about some necessities, to be quite honest, if we want to break it down. Listen, if you're trusting him, everybody, with me, this is going to sound radical. I found it in Matthew 6. If he's Lord of your life, you don't have to worry about that. You got some other things to worry about. Yeah, I don't feel like you're accepting what I'm saying. It's not my inspiration. It's God's inspiration. You don't have to worry about those things if he's Lord of your life. If he's not Lord of your life, he wants to be. He can be. You say, well, I've been, listen, here's where it gets, oh, here comes the preacher part. Listen, there's a lot of people going to stand before him. Lord, Lord, no, never knew you. It's a terrible, I hate to even say it because it sounds so flippant to say it that way. It's a terrible sight. Never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. No, no second chance. No change in my mind. Listen, you could be claiming today, Lord, Lord, but you've got a second chance to make it right. There's a lot. The churches in America are full. A lot of people saying, Lord, Lord. And they've got a chance right now to make it right. You've got a chance right now to make it right. There's going to be a time they don't have a chance. And you don't have a chance. Listen, it's not about, well, I'm worried about my tomorrow. I'm worried about my necessities. I better make him Lord of No, you got bigger problems to worry about than your food, your clothes, and your water. You got spiritual issues to worry about if he's not Lord of your life right now. Here, here's here's, a, here's a, a question that's often asked. Can a Christian really be a Christian and him not be Lord? I kind of covered that. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into details of that. Here's what I'm going to do. If you're here today and you're convinced you're a Christian and you know it and you say, right, I'm absolutely sure I'm going to heaven, but somehow you could acknowledge he's not Lord of your life, I'll leave the theology up to you and God. I'm going to tell you this. You need to make him Lord of your life. First. First. The day is coming. The day is coming where it will be revealed, one way or the other, who really has made Jesus Lord of their life. I'm not talking about when we stand before God. I believe the day is coming in America. It's already happened all over the world. The day is coming in America where it will be revealed to others whether you are or not. I don't want to make up my mind then. I want it made up now. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you for your word. I pray right now, if there's a person in this room 
that has not made you Lord of their life, that they would do it before it's too late. God, your word tells us that we've all been separated from you by sin, but that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus, your son, to pay the price to bring us back into fellowship. If we would just call on him, trust in him as our savior, make him Lord. God, God, right now I pray that there's people in this room that are professing believers that maybe deep down in their heart, they know you're not Lord. You're not first. I pray today would be the day where they make it right. Maybe they're convinced they're a Christian, but today would be the day they say, I'm selling out. He's going to be Lord. And there's definitely some, maybe here today or watching that never made a decision to make you Lord. They don't have the, the faith. They don't have the hope. They don't have the peace in knowing that you're going to take care of their needs. I pray they would make a decision today to accept you as their Savior, the Lord of their life. Lord, for those of us that are believers that are doing our best to make you Lord and keep you first, God, even though we're stressed about things that we can't control many times and stressed about tomorrow's worries and whatever may be happening, God, there are some stresses and some anxieties we don't have to worry about. And that's the fact that you will take care of us and what peace and comfort comes from that. Maybe there's some Christians here today that right now they're praying, thank you. Maybe they can pray collective, thank you God for that peace, for taking care of me and providing my necessities, making my necessities sufficient. Maybe there's some Christians here today and they're, they're born again they're doing their best to make you Lord, but they're struggling with stress and anxiety about their necessities. God, I pray today's message and your word and the Holy Spirit would calm those fears. And that right now you would draw them close to you and they would see you face to face with your arms outstretched, looking them in the eye saying, don't worry, I will take care of you. You're a good father. And you've told us in your word that you love us. You want the best for us. And you're going to provide for us. Help us to see that today.